Okay, first. Okay, I'll start by introducing two conjectures of very elementary, very concrete problems. So, throughout this talk, by n, I mean a, just a finite set of non-zero vectors in a vector space. Finite set of non-zero vectors in a vector space, finite dimensional vector space over some field, which are called phi. And whenever I have such vectors, I will associate a post set, which I call Lm, so called lattice of flats, which is the post set of subspaces spanned by subsets of M. So the elements are the subspaces and it is partially ordered by inclusion of subspaces. And from the post at Lm, I can define a one variable polynomial called chi and q, which is called the chromatic polynomial. of M and it is defined from the Mabius function of Lm and which I will write as the uh, alternating sum of minus 1 to k of mu lower k q to the rank of m minus k where k ranges from 0 to rank of n. Uh, I'll not formally define what it is but I will show you what it is by calculating one concrete example. It generalizes the chromatic polynomial of a graph when n is a configuration of vectors constructed from any graph, your favorite graph. Okay, example. This example is the so-called final plane. Maybe, maybe you have to define maybe this function. Uh, I will not. I will show you what it is. <laughs> okay. yeah. It will be evident once you see one example. I'll take my vector space as a three-dimensional vector space over a field with two elements. And I'll take my set of vectors, M, as all those vectors except zero. Then you can draw a projective image of such an M, which looks like this. You have seven vectors, eight minus one, and each line, each projected line, consists of three vectors. And there are exactly seven lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So the flats, the subspaces spanned by subsets of M, there are seven one-dimensional spaces and also seven two-dimensional spaces, one three-dimensional spaces, so on. So the post set Lm, which looks like this, the whole space at the top and the zero space at the bottom, 
And there are seven P3, P4, P5, P6, P7, and L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, L6, L7, corresponding to seven points drawn on this picture and seven lines corresponding to the lines in this projected picture. So if you illustrate the process structure, each line contains exactly three points. And obviously, those three points, again, contains the zero space. And every line is contained in the whole space. Now I'll tell you what Mabius function is. Mabius function is defined for any poset with unique minimal element. You assign plus one to the unique minimal element. This is the value of the Mabius function for this element, poset element. And then you define inductively the Mabius function by requiring that you look at any poset element and you look at all those subspaces contained in that element and you define the value of the Mabius function to be the value which sums up with all the previously defined Mabius function to zero. So here, I should assign minus one. I look at all the elements which are smaller than the given element, and I'm assigning a value so that the sum of the two things is zero. Again, for P2, I have minus one, P3 minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Also, the value of the Mabius function at L1, you look at all those elements which is contained in L1, P1, P2, P3, and zero, and I am asking all the numbers adds up to zero, so I should assign plus two here. Two minus one minus 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 one, and plus one. Similarly, um, any line contains exactly three points which has a sign value minus one. The Mobius function has value plus two on all the two-dimensional flats. And for it here, you have to write down a number which adds up with all the previously defined numbers to be zero, and that is minus eight. So this is the Mabius function of a poset. And what is the characteristic polynomial, or the chromatic polynomial, chi and q? The chi and q is defined by adding up all these numbers in the same rank. So in rank 0, you have 1. In rank 1, you have minus 7. In rank 2, you have plus 14. In rank 3, you have minus 8. So chi and q, in this case, is q3 minus q square plus 14q minus 8. So this chromatic polynomial is defined for any graded poset. So in the terminology of mu lower index, mu 0 is 1 in our example, mu 1 is 7, mu 2 is 14, mu 3 is 8. Okay, our first conjecture we'll call conjecture A proposed by Rota Welsh around 1970 and it says that for any vector configuration M or more generally for any matroid M we have mu k minus 1 mu k plus 1 less than or equal to mu k square. So in short, the numbers produced in this way, the coefficients of the chromatic polynomial forms a low concave sequence. Okay, so these numbers mu are rather mysterious. So I'll give you 
of far more concrete numbers, which is equally interesting. Oh, it's this part. The second conjecture concerns these numbers, which I'll call IK associated to any vector configuration M. And it is defined to be the number of K element independent subsets of M. So going back to our example, the final plane. So what is I0 of the final plane? It's the number of zero element independent subsets of M. We define it to be 1. I1 is number of independent subsets of cardinality 1. It's 7. I2, which is number of independent subsets of cardinality 2, is 7 choose 2, which is 21, because any two elements, two vectors are independent. And I3 is, now something interesting happens. You pick any three of the seven vectors. Not all of them are independent. In fact, exactly seven of them are dependent, corresponding to seven lines drawn there. So I3 is... 28. Okay, the conjecture, which I'll call conjecture B, uh, proposed by Walsh and later Mason around the same time. Again, for any M, any vector configuration, or any matroid M, IK minus 1, IK plus 1 is less than or equal to IK square. So in other words, the number of independence numbers IK form a low concave sequence. It does. I mean, it's very low concave in our example, 1, 7, 21, 28. And for the numbers B, we have 1, 7, 14, 8, which is less low concave, but uh, OK. So results. First of all, I wasn't very aware of this, but it was known that A implies B. This is due to. Brulovsky uh, back in 1970s and recently and independently again observed by Matthias Lenz very recently. And last year uh, at the talk here I showed that A holds in characteristic zero. So last year Okay, the main selling point today is A holds in any characteristic. This is a joint work with Eric Katz, now moving to Waterloo. Yeah. And I think the proof is kind of interesting. I'll show you there are some of the main ideas. There are two independent parts. First of all, the first part says that, which consists of my second part of the talk, between Uh, concerns where this local concave sequence comes from. My 
assertion is that all of them has a geometric origin. They all come from the so-called correspondences between spaces. So I'll begin by telling you what correspondence is. Wait, now, can I ask you something? Okay. So for A implies B, you, uh, you only need uh, one particular. So what if A is true for a matrix M? Then, then B is true as well? Or you need to uh, so say something more? What Brilovsky shows is uh -huh. this. Uh -huh. If you're given a matroid uh -huh. with some specified chromatic polynomial uh -huh. and with some specified polynomial encoding these numbers, uh -huh. then you can find another matroid constructed out of M whose this so-called F polynomial is the chromatic polynomial of the newly constructed matroid. So any of these numbers are in fact news of some other matroid. And if uh, and you know that it's uh, representable? Or yes, so in such a way that if your original matroid was representable over some field, then the newly constructed matroid is representable over some finite extension field of the original matroid, but still preserving the characteristic and all, so on. So for instance, if you prove it for uh, some particular field, then that it prove for it and its extension? Yes. Yeah. OK, I'll proceed by. Um, giving you another very concrete question, very classical in algebraic geometry. So let's consider P2. Uh, you can consider as a complex projective plane if you want, but for every, any field. And we are interested in, and many people were before, hundreds of years ago, self-maps, self-rational maps from P2 to P2. Such a map is given by the ratio of three homogeneous polynomials, each in three variables, and all of them in the same degree. If you're given, say for example, degree D homogeneous polynomial in x, y, z, three of them, you can define a rational map, not necessarily ever defined, uh, mapping P2 to itself, degree D polynomials in three variables, x, y, z. And we know that this map is generally a covering map in the topological sense, if you are thinking of the complex projective plane. And you can ask, what is the covering degree of this map, let's say phi? First observation, this is essentially a Bazou theorem degree of phi, and by this degree I mean a topological covering degree, is at most d square. So the question is, which integer e less than or equal to d square is possible as a degree by cleverly choosing three homogeneous polynomials of degree d without common factors. OK. I can answer this um, in somewhat uh, in a broader generality. Pick any homology theory, let's say H star. And then you consider any element in the homology class of P2 plus P2, say with integer coefficient. And the assertion is that By the Kuhner theorem, I can write, if the dimension of C is 2, 
I can write it as um, P2 cross P0 plus P1 cross P1 C P0 times P2. Then, to C is a homology class of some variety for a sub variety V in P2 plus P2 if and only if um, B square is greater than AC uh, unless C is um, is a multiple of P2 cross P0 or a multiple of P1 cross P1 or a multiple of oops um, sorry P0 times P2 so in particular if you consider the graph of this rational map drawn on P2 cross P2 then that it is a sub variety of P2 cross P2 and the homology class associated to such a graph corresponds to triple of numbers of which the first is 1 because our graph is coming from a rational map and the second number b corresponds to the d degree d defining the rational map and the third number c corresponds to the topological covering map so the answer is all such e as a particular case And of course, you can ask the same question for higher dimensional projective spaces. And for such things, um, we have the following weaker result, which is sufficient for our purpose. Like C as a sum of the classes of P k minus i times P i living inside the homology group of um, say H K or 2K depending on your point of view PM times PM let's see so no matter what homology theory you want to use, you at least you have a Kinder theorem for Pn times Pn, and any homology class can be written as a linear uh, combination of the classes of these linear spaces. And so any homology class corresponds to a sequence of integers Ei. And I want to know a condition on the sequence Ei so that the condition is equivalent to the representability of C by a single irreducible sub variety living inside PM cross PM. Okay. Uh, the answer is first, if C is an integer multiple of one of P0 times P0, a class of a point, or a class of Pn times P0, or P0 times Pn, or Pn times Pn, then C uh, is representable meaning that it is a class of a sub variety if and only if the multiplied integer is 1 secondly if otherwise in all other cases some positive integer multiple of C is representable 
if and only if EI form a sequence of non-negative low concave sequence without internal zeros. Having no internal zero simply means that you cannot have zero in between two non-zero numbers. So first assertion, if you have a sub variety in the product of projective space, and if you take write down the, its homology class in this particular way, then you have a sequence of non-negative integers of low concave sequence without internal zero. Conversely, whenever you have such a sequence, then by taking a positive integer multiple, we can actually find the sub variety representing the low concavity of such a sequence inside here. So if you want to prove a conjecture which says that some sequence is low concave, then the natural thing you need to do is to find the natural sub variety living inside here which witnesses that fact. And that is what we are going to do. Okay, what is that sub variety in our case? Okay, going back to our original notation, m is a finite set of vectors in a vector space. Uh, and instead of looking at as a set of vectors, I'll look at as a set of hyperplanes, which is called the arrangement of hyperplanes, which I'll call A of hyperplanes in some vector space um, by abuse of notation of projective device. B. So I have finite set of hyper planes inside some projective space over a field. I'll write the defining equations of these hyperplanes to be oops um, and and so Li are the linear forms defining my hyperplanes corresponding to a vector. So I will embed this projective space, all dimensional projective space, in a larger projective space Pn, where n comes from the number of hyperplanes, minus 1, so that uh, the complement of my arrangement is simply the complement of H0 and Hn, where Hi is the standard nth plane lying inside Pn. So if you take away n plus 1 standard hyperplanes from Pn, then you have an n-dimensional torus. And I'm just simply asking that my, I will embed three so that the complement coincides with the intersection with that big torus. So very concretely, I'm simply looking at the embedding given by PL to PN by taking the ratios L0, L1, and Lm. And there is no harm in assuming that all the hyperplanes have no points in common. Okay, first step, consider the so-called standard Kramer transformation between Pn. It is a rational self-map 
from Pn to Pn given by that is inverting all the coordinates. It's a rational map. And remember, now our V and the arrangement complement V minus A lives inside Pn. Let V tilde, which lives in Pn cross Pn, be the graph of this map Kramina. Uh, on V. So it is defined as follows. This map is not defined everywhere, but it is defined on an open band set on V. And just draw the graph on where it is defined. And take just simply the Jarisky closure of V tilde. So V tilde is a irreducible sub variety living inside the PN cross PN. And in fact, if you think about it, this V tilde is the so-called uh, very nice compactification of the arrangement complement V minus A in the sense that there is an open dense set lying inside V tilde uh, whose boundary is a divisor with normal crossings. Okay, so what is the assertion? Our main result is that Let's write C with overline to be the polynomial obtained by dividing the chromatic polynomial by Q minus 1. You can always divide and obtain an integer polynomial because by definition, uh, any chromatic polynomial has root 1. And I'll write this thing again as the uh, alternating sum, this time with upper index mu i, q to the r minus i, i equals 0 to r. Here, r is the dimension of phi. Then the assertion is that if you take the class of v tilde inside the pn cross pn, then it is simply in a combination of mu i of p r minus i times p i, which lives inside your homology theory h r p n cross p n with integer coefficients. And this holds over any characteristic. So if you work on over characteristic 0, and you take the field to be complex numbers, in fact, you can always do that, then you can just take the singular homology HR, in which case you should write H2R rather instead of HR. And if you are working over a field of characteristic P, then, for example, you can take the so-called char homology group here, and everything holds in the same way. Okay. So, by the result mentioned before, we have as a corollary new upper index i is low concave, non negative, no internal zeros, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, by the old definition, a very simple calculation shows that new upper index i, the sequence of original interest, is low concave. In fact, the product of any two, convolution product of any two low concave sequence produces a low concave sequence. And by the result I mentioned before, the so-called independent slumbers I, K, is also low concave. So is R the rank of M? Or? In fact, um, R plus 1 is the rank of M. Right. So I, I'm pro projectivizing everything. And the condition here that provided that your matrix M is representable over some field. So I don't have a result uh, for arbitrary matrix. 
okay, that's nice, but how would you prove a result something like this? Um, in characteristic zero, the result I explained to you last year was kind of um, not very satisfactory. It uses a lot of different things, and it really doesn't look like a combinatorics. But this time, we have really a combinatorial proof, except one line. So the replacing that one line by a combinatorial argument uh, is uh, the way I think uh, how to prove, approach these problems for general matrix. So why is this uh, combinatorics, or this homology classes, all this? Uh, the very natural setting is provided by the so-called tropical geometry. So, uh, maybe I missed one point. So if you multiply two log concave polynomials, then it's log concave? Take, yes. Ah. Right, that is correct. So that's why you... Yes. Right. Yeah. The first implies the second. Okay, I'll very quickly introduce what tropical geometry is. So it started from a uh, work of Bergman. He defined the so-called Bergman's logarithmic limit set. It is defined for any sub-variety of an uh, n-dimensional complex torus, say sub-variety of dim O. Then you can scroll code, consider a neighbor of V is a set of real vectors uh, of the form log absolute value V1 and log of absolute value of Vn living inside R n, where uh, V ranges over uh, the points, complex points in your original sub -variety. So it's a real semi-algebraic set living in R n associated to any sub -variety of a torus. Okay, here's an example you can work out. For example, if V is X plus Y plus 1 equals 0, living inside the two-dimensional torus, then the amoeba AV looks like this. It lives on XY plane, and this is roughly how it looks like. And the crucial observation of Bergman is that no matter what sub variety you start with, if you consider intersection of your amoeba with a sphere or circle large and large enough, then it eventually degenerates into a certain combinatorial structure. In fact, it degenerates into a fan now called the Bergman fan. In this case, the Bergman fan of this thing is simply this. And this fan describes the asymptotic behavior of the amoeba. And it was soon quickly realized that you can do, you can produce something like this in over any field. You equip or you extend your original field uh, with the so-called valuation and you can produce uh, Bergman fan out of that valuation, for example, p adding numbers, crucial series field, uh, and so on. The point is, whenever you have a sub variety, you have a combinatorial skeleton of your algebraic variety, which we call the Bergman fan. It's known that if you start with the all dimensional sub variety of a course, then you end up getting an all-dimensional fan lying in some large ambient space on it. 
And our result comes from by applying all this machinery in case when V is a linear space representing your matroid. In that case, we know that this Bergman fan, the structure of Bergman fan can be described in a purely combinatorial way. So let's say M is a matroid on 0, 1 to N. And fix the basis E1 to EN of ZN. And I'll set E0 to be minus E1 of minus EN. Then, whether M is representable in the field or not, you can associate a fan inside ZN, the so called the Bergman fan. M is uh, a fan whose k dimensional cones, say sigma f, corresponds to uh, K step flex of proper flex F this F here F one F two F K. So what we do is this. We look at the matroid or vector configuration and you form a pole set as we did before. And you look at all the flags in that flat associated to each one of these flats, which is now just a subset of 0, 1 to n. You associate a vector which is sum of EIs where the sum ranges over those indices where i is contained in f. So each flat corresponds to a vector in here. And whenever you have a k-step flat of flats, you take the positive whole of all these associated vectors. That is your cone, sigma f. And if you do this for all flats, then you have a nice fan with all those combinatorial properties which an abstract tropical variety should satisfy. And we can do the intersection theory in a tropical setting. Okay. Okay, here's the main assertion. For any M, Whether M is representable or not, if we write uh, the sequence of interest, mu k is defined by the number of points in the delta of creation k of n dot delta or minus delta of truncation n minus k of u n. Yes. Let me explain what my assertion is. So here delta means that the fan we have just constructed before. Whenever you have a matroid, you can construct the fan, so called delta. And this truncation means that simply a truncation of a matroid it corresponds to slicing by a general section of your hyperplane arrangement. And this UN is the simply the uniform matroid N. Its independent sets are any subset of 0, 1 to N. And the assertion is, if you, can, if you consider each one of them 
These are fan. This is a fan. This is a k-dimensional fan. This is a n-minus k-dimensional fan. And there is a way of intersecting two fans. You perturb the second fan in a generic direction. Then by the dimension condition, the two fans meet in finite number of points. And that number of points is our sequence of interest, mu k. Okay. I have, I guess, five minutes. I'll show you what I am doing. Okay, let's end the, the vector configuration of four vectors like this. Say 0, 1, 2, 3. And three vectors lie on a line like this. So our post set looks like uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, corresponding to the whole space. 0, 1, 2, corresponding to this line. 0, 3, 1, 3, and 2, 3, and 0, 1, 2, 3, and empty. If you calculate our radius function, then you get the sequence 1 minus 4, 5, and minus 2. This is our sequence of interest. And what we are doing here is this. First, you construct your fan. Say, for example, um, k equals r. So you are not truncating at all. In this case, this is a rank 3 matroid. We are constructing delta m two dimensional cone line on R3 which uh, whose flats corresponds to uh, whose cones corresponds to inclusion of flats all those inclusions A2 2, 3 so for example, this inclusion of flat, flats corresponds to the cone generated by E1, E2, E3, E3, and E2 plus E3. So this is the cone corresponding to this. And for example, this one, this is a little bit harder to draw because 0 corresponds to minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 direction. And 0, 1, 2 corresponds to minus E3. And that inclusion corresponds to this one. So trunk K is what? It's a, it's a so fan. Yeah, so I'm, I'm writing here two-dimensional case of this thing. So my assertion is, in this case, if k equals r, one less than the rank of m, then I'm not truncating at all. If you do this thing for each one of your thing, you end up getting Right, I'll, I'll tell you what that is. Dot corresponds to the so-called intersection product in the classical intersection theory. But we have a tropical dot in this sense. And that simply corresponds to the intersection of two fans. I'll show you how to intersect two fans. So for example, here, I have another cone corresponding to 1 included in 1, 3, and a bunch of other two-dimensional cones. And here, what, what I want here is the truncation of 3 minus 2, which is 1 in our case. One truncation of the uniform matroid simply corresponds to the 0, 1, 
two, three. And this thing corresponds to uh, this one one dimensional fan, E1, E2, E3 minus E1 minus E2 minus E3. So what I'm doing here is first you invert the second fan by putting minus. So minus looks like this. Minus E1, minus E2, minus E3, E1 plus E2 plus E3. Now you're intersecting this thing with that. How would you do that? As in the classical case, first move your second fan. This is the moving lemma in a general direction. So this is the origin going this direction, this direction, this direction, and one, one, one direction. And the number of intersections is finite. It intersects here one time, two. This ray does not hit any two-dimensional cones. You can check. And also, this ray does not intersect any two-dimensional cones. You can check. And also, the number of intersection points you produce in this way does not uh, depend on your original perturbation. And this number is well defined. And this is called the tropical intersection number. So for the rest of the thing, what we're going to do is um, do a little tropical geometry and little correspondence between tropical setting and the usual setting and say that this number really comes from the homology class of our variety, which was called free tilde. And therefore, they are low concave. But if in the very, except for the very last step, we are not using the real algebraic geometry. Everything, every argument is combinatorial and makes sense for arbitrary matrix. And in a sense, very geometric, even for non-representable ones. What is missing is this. At the final step, uh, the low concavity essentially comes from the so-called Hodge index theorem in the complex geometry. What we need is tropical version of this thing, Hodge theory over nothing. And that nothing, uh, that thing, if such a thing exists, would be very interesting, not just for this kind of low concavity conjectures, because this combinatorial statement would lie in behind the, all the Hodge theory characteristic P, Q, P, I, D, theory, or whatever. That is certainly very interesting. And that's all. Thank you for coming. I'll be happy to discuss any of these things.